السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ نحمد و نسلی علی رسول کریم اما بعد فعود بلّہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ربش رحلی صدری و یسرلی امری وحل العقدۃ من لسانی یفقہ قولی ربنا زدنا علما رمضان شہر الصیام the month of fasting شہر القرآن the month of قرآن شہر الاحسان the month of worshipping اللہ سبحانہ و تعالی with excellence with beauty رمضان is this one month of the year in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made fasting an obligation upon us. It is the month in which we do not have a choice. Meaning if we wish to fast, we can fast. And if we wish to leave fasting, we can leave fasting. No, it is something that has been made obligatory upon us, necessary for us. And in the Qur'an, from the sunnah, we do learn about people who are exempt from this obligation. But in general sense, Every person who believes in Allah in the last day, who says that he is a Muslim, that she is a Muslim, then they must observe this pillar of faith, which is fasting in the month of Ramadan. Now when it comes to fasting, what are we doing essentially? When we're observing our fast, we are basically putting aside our bodily needs. We are putting aside our need to eat, our need to drink, our need to rest, our need to enjoy sexual relations, we are putting these needs aside, we are restricting them to just a few hours of the day, which is in fact not the day, but the night. Just the time between sunset and sunrise. This is the time when we can fulfill our bodily needs. What about the rest of the time? What are we doing? Why are we taught to keep away from fulfilling our bodily needs? So that we can attend to the needs of the soul. So that we can pay attention to our heart also. We can reflect on our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can nourish, we can feed the soul. Because by this point, the soul has become hungry, it has become thirsty, it needs some attention. Because if you think about it, throughout the year, what are we doing generally? We are fulfilling our bodily needs. And our bodily needs are such that no matter how much you pursue them, no matter how much you try to fulfill them, they are never fully accomplished. Think about it. Has it ever happened that you go get a haircut done and then you think, yeah, I'm done for life? No. Does it ever happen that you get your hair dyed and you say, okay, I'm done for one year? No, not possible. Does it ever happen that you eat something in the morning and you say, khalas, I'm done, I'm good for one week? No way. Our body is such that it is needy. Every few hours, every few minutes, every few days, it has needs, it becomes thirsty, it becomes greedy, it wants to be satisfied. You know, just like a crying baby, What happens to that baby? It has a need. It needs to be changed. It needs to be fed. The baby needs to be burped. The baby needs to be loved. Isn't that so? So what happens to the mother who is constantly attending to the needs of her child? What happens to her? Does she end up neglecting herself? Does she end up neglecting her own health? Yes. She's... getting less sleep, she's not able to eat well, she's not able to socialize much, she is a mess. So then what happens? She needs some time to herself. When somebody will come and say, I've got the baby, you go get some rest. I've got the baby, you go eat. I've got the baby, you take a day off. You go have some fun. Now we see that if the body has so many needs, and if throughout our lives we are pursuing the needs of the body, what will happen to the soul? Will it not be neglected? Will it not feel hungry and thirsty? Yes. Because just as the body has needs, our soul also has needs. It has a need. What need? It has a need to be nourished. And what is the nourishment? What is the food for the soul, for the heart? It is the Qur'an. 
the soul has the need to be disciplined. And what is it that will discipline, that will train the soul? It is the act of fasting. It is this worship of fasting that will discipline and train the soul. The soul, it has longings, it has desires that must be addressed. It has yearnings that must be heard. It needs to make dua. It needs to call out to its Lord. So it needs to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when in the month of Ramadan, we are putting our bodily needs aside, we are restricting ourselves to just a few hours to fulfill our bodily needs, the rest of the time, what is it that we are paying attention to? What is it that we need to focus on? The needs of the soul. It's nourishment. It's discipline. It's yearnings. It needs to be heard. It needs to make dua. It needs to listen to the Qur'an. It needs to be disciplined. And this is what the month of Ramadan is about. Now what happens is, that when we continue to feed the body, then what will happen to the soul? It will eventually become weak. It will starve. It will lose its strength. And this is something that's very natural. When we pay too much attention to one thing, then the other becomes neglected. And the one who is neglected, what will happen to it? Will it become stronger over time or will it become weak over time? It will become weak over time. Have you ever experienced this? That your body is very comfortable in bed. Very comfortable. Alright? You're feeling relaxed. Your bed is nice and cozy. The temperature in your room is just perfect. There is no noise. Neither in the street nor in the house. The TVs are off, the phones are off, the children are sleeping, and you are having a good time in your bed. Your body is enjoying. Now, it is time to pray. Is there some tension between the body and the soul over here? Is there? The body wants to sleep, but the soul needs to get up. It needs the body to cooperate with it. Right? Get up. Wake up. It's time to pray. Now what happens? If the soul is equipped with taqwa, if it is nourished well, if it is strong, then what will happen? The soul will win. Its need will be given priority. But if the body has been fed this whole time, then who will win here? the body will win. So the month of Ramadan is about strengthening our souls so that the rest of the year, inshallah, whenever we are in a situation where our physical pleasures are pulling us to one side, but our spiritual needs demand from us that we do something else, then we want that our soul also wins. We want that we have the strength to respond to the need of the soul. This is what we want to do. This is what the month of Ramadan is about. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that, أَعْطِي كُلَّ ذِي حَقٍ حَقَّهُ Give every deserver of a right its right. Meaning everyone that deserves a haqq, that deserves a right, that has a right over something, then it must be given. So the body has a right, it has a need. And whether somebody tells us or not, we are very good at looking after the needs of our body. But the soul also has a need. So this month, the focus is on what? On the soul. Nourishing it, strengthening it, responding to its need, disciplining it. The Prophet ﷺ, he used to make this dua. Which dua was it? Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'an وَعَمَلَ مُتَقَبَّلًا وَرِزْقًا طَيِّبًا That, O oh Allah, I ask you for عِلْمًا نَافِعًا What is عِلْمًا نَافِعًا? Beneficial, useful knowledge. Secondly, عَمَلًا مُتَقَبَّلًا Deeds that are accepted. Accepted by who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Efforts that are rewarded by Allah. And thirdly, رِزْقًا طَيِّبًا Provision that is pure. Now if you reflect on this dua, what do we see? Ilm, knowledge. That is the need of the mind. It needs knowledge. Amal mutaqabbal. 
good, useful, productive deeds. This is the need of the soul. Because the soul, our heart, it needs to feel like it has accomplished something. And thirdly, رِزْقًا طَيِّبًا Good provision, that is the need of the body. Good provision is the need of the body. So the Prophet ﷺ asked Allah for the nourishment of all these three aspects of our lives. The mind, the soul, and the body. Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'an wa amalan mutaqabbalan wa rizqan tayyiba. Now if you think about it, when we exert our effort in doing something, any action that we are doing, any action at all, do we want that that effort, that action should be worth it? That at the end, we actually get something from it, so that we feel, yes, this effort was worth it. So for example, if you go to the mall for two hours, why? To find a jacket for yourself. All right? And what happens? Two hours you spend in the mall, walking up and down, all right? but you don't come out with a jacket. How do you feel? How do you feel? Disappointed. You put in so much effort. You even brought your husband's money. He gave it to you, willingly. All right? Or you brought your money that you had been saving for such a long time. You had the car to yourself. You had a babysitter watching your children. All right? You prepared dinner before coming. You put in so much effort to make sure you would find a jacket. But you don't find a jacket. How does it feel? That your entire effort was worthless. Worthless. Now the month of Ramadan is an entire month in which every single day we are refraining from eating and drinking. We will be spending sleepless nights. We will be spending inshallah hours standing in prayer. So we want that at the end of the month we have actually achieved something. We have gained something. This entire month of worship is accepted and rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And really it brings about a change in our lives, a permanent change in our lives. So for this purpose, we must set some goals for ourselves. Just like when you go to the mall, you find out where the stores are. Right? You're not just going to go up and down the aisles thinking, okay, maybe there's a store here. Oh, maybe there's a store there. No. You're going to find out if those stores are even there at the mall. And if they are, where are they? And where they are, whatever stores they are, do they even carry jackets? Because if you end up spending your time going from one children's store to another, you're not going to end up with a jacket at all. So you have to have some kind of a plan. So what is our plan? What is our goal for this month of Ramadan? I don't know about you, but this is what I have for myself. And that is that by the end of this month, inshallah, my level of knowledge of the Qur'an, it should have increased. It should have improved. Because the Prophet ﷺ prayed that, Oh Allah, give me beneficial knowledge. And what is beneficial knowledge other than the Qur'an? It is the source of ilm because this is the kalam of Allah. So by the end of this month, by the end of the month of Ramadan, inshallah, knowledge of the Qur'an should be at a higher level, at a greater level. Secondly, when performing any action, any action, whether it is the action of fasting, of praying qiyamul layl, or giving sadaqah, or of going to a gathering of knowledge, spending time with the family, any action, inshallah, pay attention to two things. The intention and the manner. Why the intention? Because a deed could be very beautiful on the outward. On the apparent, it could be very beautiful. But if the intention is corrupt, then that action will bring no reward at all. It will bring no reward at all. Because the fact is that when a person is performing a good deed. And if the heart is mutawajjihun ilallah, it is directed to Allah, it is focused on Allah. Meaning, the purpose, the goal is to obtain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The intention is correct. Then what will happen? That deed will be a cause of success. Why? Because that deed will be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And if there is an action which is apparently very good, but the heart is not directed to Allah, then that same action could be a cause of our very destruction and eternal failure. That apparently righteous deed could be a cause of a person ending up in hellfire. Because who are the first people who will be judged on the Day of Judgment? Who will be sent to their destination on the Day of Judgment? Number one amongst them is the one who reads the Qur'an. Who reads the Qur'an, but he does not do it for the right reason. So Allah will call him and he will question him. I gave you this and I gave you that. What did you do? He will say, Ya Allah, I read your book. I used to recite it. Allah will say, you did it. However, you didn't do it for me. You did it so that you would be praised. And you were praised. You got that praise. So now there is no reward for you. And that person will be sent to hellfire. Apparently a very noble and righteous deed the recitation of the Qur'an. But that very deed can become the cause of eternal punishment in the hellfire. Why? Because of the corruption of the intention. So when we fast, when we give charity, when we pray, when we volunteer, any, any good deed in this month, what is the intention going to be? The heart should be mutawajjihun ilallah. It must be focused on Allah. Ya Allah, I'm doing this for you. So when we're fasting those long hours, and our mouth is dry, our body is exhausted, we are feeling fatigued, don't complain. Don't be upset. Don't worry. Tell your Lord, Ya Rabbi, I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this only for you, because I would never do it for any other reason. I wouldn't do it if I had to lose weight. I wouldn't do it if I wanted to impress people. I couldn't do it. But I'm doing this for you. So you be pleased with me. You save me from punishment. You forgive my sins because of this small effort that I'm doing, that I'm making for your sake. Niyyah. The intention must be correct. And secondly, the manner. The manner of performing those good deeds must also be beautiful. It must also be with ihsan, with excellence. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he used to worship throughout the year. But in the month of Ramadan, his worship became more beautiful. It became more beautiful. So for example, we learn that the Prophet ﷺ was a very generous man. He would spend very easily, very generously. He would give. He would give food, he would give money, he would give gold, he would give camels, he would give clothes. A man came and said to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, I love the shawl that you're wearing. Can I have it? The Prophet ﷺ went home, took that shawl off, and sent it to that man. He was very generous. Very generous. But in the month of Ramadan, he was more generous than the fast wind. Think about it. Fast wind when it blows. Do you see it affecting the leaves on the trees? Do you see the trees moving because of the fast wind? Do you see the grass moving? Yes. Do you feel like your house is also being affected by the wind? Your windows perhaps? Or you can hear the wind blowing even when you're inside the house. We see the effects of fast wind. We sense them. We feel them. Because nothing is left untouched by the fast wind. Likewise, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so beautiful was his sadaqah in the month of Ramadan that nothing was left untouched. He would pray Qiyamul Layl throughout the year, but in the month of Ramadan, even more beautifully. He would recite the Qur'an regularly, but in the month of Ramadan, every night he reviewed the Qur'an with Angel Jibreel. So his ibadah became more beautiful in the month of Ramadan. And this is what we want to accomplish as well. Amalan mutaqabbalan. We want that our effort is accepted. When will it be accepted? When the intention is right. And when the manner is beautiful. It is done for the pleasure of Allah. And it is done according to the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the third thing, with respect to rizqan tayyiban, that we want to have improved eating habits also by the end of this month. Not 
eating habits that have gotten worse over the course of this month, but rather eating habits that have improved over the course of this month. That when I'm eating something, look, is it tayyib or is it khabis? Is it pure or is it impure? Is it something that will strengthen my body or weaken my body? Is it something that will hydrate my body or dehydrate my body? Is it something that will fill my body with energy or is it something that will drain my body of energy? Rizqan tayyiban. Good, pure provision also. Because what happens is that when we're fasting and we've been refraining from eating and drinking, we tend to compromise on the quality for the sake of the taste. Because what happens is that we start rewarding ourselves with food when we break our fast. No. If we reward ourselves with unhealthy food, we're not rewarding ourselves. We're actually punishing ourselves. The Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Allah, give me rizqan tayyiban. So we should compromise on the taste, but not on the quality. Now, the first thing that the month of Ramadan is about is fasting. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, that فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْهُ That whoever among you witnesses this month, he lives to see this month. And may Allah allow us to live to see this month and live through this month. Whoever does so, then Allah says, فَلْيَصُمْهُ Then he must fast during this month. He must observe fasting. Because fasting is one of the pillars of Islam. The Prophet ﷺ said that Islam is built upon five things, five pillars. And of them is, of them is, وَصَوْمِ Ramadan, Fasting in the month of Ramadan. Fasting is a very unique act of worship. Because we are told to keep away from eating and drinking. We are supposed to be hungry and thirsty. So much so that even if we have one sip of water in front of us, we cannot have it. We cannot have it. Not allowed. If we have it deliberately, knowingly, then our fast has been broken. It's finished. We cannot even have one bite of food. Now, It's such a unique act of worship. And this is why the reward of this unique act of worship is also very unique. It's very unique. In a hadith we learn, the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah ﷺ says that all the deeds of the son of Adam are for them. Except fasting, which is for me. Fasting is for who? Allah. How? Because we are depriving ourselves. We are sacrificing on our own needs. We are putting our needs aside. We are focusing on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, fasting is for me. And when it is for Allah, Allah says, I shall reward for it. What is that reward? Allah doesn't tell us. The Prophet ﷺ, he doesn't tell us what that reward is. Yes, one thing we know is that the people who fast will be invited to enter Jannah through a special gate. Meaning they will be given special honor on the day of judgment. But what other reward is there in Jannah reserved for people who fast? Allahu A'lam. Allahu A'lam. فَلَا تَعْلَمُ نَفْسٌ مَا أُخْفِيَ لَهُمْ مِنْ قُرَّةِ أَعْيُنْ No soul knows what reward Allah has kept as a secret for them. Why? Because of what they used to do. It's a secret. Allah has kept it. Now, fasting, what is the purpose of fasting? Is it just to make us hungry and thirsty? To make us cranky? To make us physically weak? No. Allah Himself tells us what the objective, what the purpose of fasting is. And what is that? لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you can have taqwa. What is taqwa? Protection. Why do we fast? So that we can protect our soul from committing sin in this life. Because when we are fasting, we are disciplining our desires. We are training our soul. So we are teaching it, we are preparing it, we are strengthening it, so that it can be protected from sin. So لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you develop taqwa, meaning you shield yourself from committing sin in this life. And also 
so that you may shield yourself, protect yourself from the punishment in the next life. Because fasting is an act of worship that erases our sins. The Prophet ﷺ said, أَصْيَامُ جُنَّةِ Fasting is a shield. Has it ever happened that there's something dangerous and you need a shield to protect yourself from that danger? So for instance, in the winter months, what happens when there's minus 30 outside with a wind chill and a storm? What happens? Do you go outside with your hands exposed? Never. You don't do that. When I first came to Canada, I hated gloves. All right, I still don't like them. I don't like covering my hands. I feel like when I cannot touch the wheel, when I cannot touch something, I, I feel very restricted. All right. So for many years, I avoided wearing gloves. However, when I started driving, and I had to take my kids to school and everything, in the morning you're leaving, that's when I finally gave up. And I started wearing gloves. Why? Because I learned that if I don't wear gloves and I touch the cold car and my hands are exposed because I'm putting the kids in the car, what will happen to my hands? They will freeze. They will become so cold that my bones will hurt. Literally the bones hurt. Right? The cold just gets inside. So we need to shield ourselves. In the summer, what do we need? Sunscreen, screen, shield, protection. Right? So... We also need protection from hellfire. We also need protection from punishment in the grave, from punishment on the day of judgment. So what is one of those deeds that will protect us from punishment, that will shield us from Naur Jahannam? It is the act of fasting. Because Allah says that fasting has been made obligatory on you. Why? لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ the purpose of fasting is not to keep us hungry and thirsty. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that there are many who fast, but they get nothing from their fast except for hunger. And there are many who pray, and they get nothing from their prayer except sleepless nights. So the point of fasting, the point of this month, is not to torture our bodies. No, it is to strengthen our soul. It is to equip the soul, to train the soul. Now, the month of Ramadan is not just a month of fasting. Because when Allah mentions Ramadan in the Qur'an, you heard the ayat at the beginning. What do we learn? What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about the month of Ramadan? Shahru Ramadan alladhi, the month of Ramadan is that in which unzila fihi al-Qur'an. In which the Qur'an was revealed. So when Allah mentions Ramadan, before He mentions fasting, what does he tell us about Ramadan? That this is the time when Allah revealed the Qur'an. When Allah honored you with His gift of guidance. He honored you. He gave you His kalam so that you may be guided in this life. This is why we celebrate this month. How? By fasting. In a hadith we learn that it was not just the Qur'an that was revealed in the month of Ramadan. The suhuf of Ibrahim, they were revealed in Ramadan. The Tawrat was revealed in Ramadan. The Zabur was revealed in the month of Ramadan. The Injil was revealed in the month of Ramadan. And when Allah revealed the Qur'an, again He chose the month of Ramadan. So there's something special about this month. It is the month of divine revelation. It is the month when Allah gifted His servants revelation. Wahi, ilm, nur, huda, furqan. So this is the time when we are grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this gift of guidance. And how do we express that gratitude? By fasting. Not by partying, not by feasting, but how? By fasting. And not just fasting, but also reconnecting with the book of Allah in this month. Because no matter how much we love the Qur'an, what happens over time is that our recitation of the Qur'an, it begins to decrease. The Qur'an that we have memorized, the portions of the Qur'an that we have memorized, what happens? We begin to forget them. The commands that we have studied in the Qur'an, that we have learned in the Qur'an, what happens? We begin to forget them. 
Why? Because we're so busy the rest of the year. And that is normal. It happens. We are human beings. We are meant to forget. Insan after all is from Nisyan. And Nisyan is to forget. So Insan forgets. We are human beings. We forget. It's something that's normal. But what is the cure to forgetfulness? What is the solution? How do you counter that? How do you counter that? By reminding yourself. Isn't it? So for example, if you know that you're going to forget to take your grocery bags, right, in the morning when you leave for work, what do you do? Do you put a reminder on your phone? Do you put a reminder on your phone? On your iPad, on your computer, and now you have reminders that are connected with all your gadgets. Right? So in case you miss one, the other will tell you, and the other will tell you. And in addition to all of this, we also have those sticky notes that we put everywhere. Sometimes in our cars. Right? Sometimes in our books. Bathroom mirrors. Isn't it? Kitchen, above the kitchen sink. We have a list of reminders. Isn't it so? Why? Because we forget. Now the Qur'an, we also forget the Qur'an. We also forget the Qur'an. Let's admit it, we do. We forget its messages. We're human beings, right? You know when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, when he died, Abu Bakr anhu was not in Medina. Because in the morning at Fajr time, the Prophet ﷺ was perfectly fine. He got up, he lifted his curtain, he saw the Sahaba praying. And the Sahaba, they said that it was as if, you know, the people were going to be put into a fitna. We were about to break our prayer because we were so excited that the Prophet ﷺ is here. He's fine because he had been unwell for the last couple of days. So what happened in the morning? He was fine. Abu Bakr anhu, he finished his salah, met the Prophet ﷺ, and he went outside of Medina to run a few errands. And what happened? In that time, Rasulullah ﷺ passed away. When he passed away, the Sahaba were in shock. Umar anhu is standing in the masjid, angry at people. Nobody dare say that Rasulullah ﷺ has died. And imagine if Umar is saying that, who can respond to him? Nobody said anything. But people were just crying. Abu Bakr who came in. He came in, he went into the house of Aisha anha, his daughter. That is where the Prophet ﷺ was because his head was in her lap when he passed away. Abu Bakr who went, he kissed the forehead of the Prophet ﷺ. And he said that Allah will not put you through two deaths. This is something that we accepted. And he said words of praise for the Prophet ﷺ that how beautiful you were alive and how beautiful you are when you have passed away. Abu Bakr who went outside and he sees Umar who standing angry at people. And the people are afraid, worried. And Abu Bakr who told Umar, sit down. Umar who refused. Abu Bakr who recited the Qur'an. He recited the Qur'an. He reminded the people that وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ That Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was only a messenger. قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ Messengers have passed before him. أَفَإِمْ مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلَ إِنْ قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ If he has died or he has been killed, then will you turn back on your heels? And Abu Bakr رضي الله عنه said his famous words of whoever used to, Worship Muhammad, then he should know that Muhammad has died, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But whoever used to worship Allah must know that Allah is ever living, eternal. Umar anhu he said that when he heard that ayah, he felt as though the ground beneath his feet had disappeared. He felt he could not stand any longer. He just sat down. The Sahaba said. It was as if for the first time ever they were listening to that ayah. First time ever they were listening to that ayah. And when was this ayah revealed? After the battle of Uhud, just a few years ago. But what happened over time? Did they not forget it? They forgot it because they were human beings. They were human beings. And the Sahaba were the people who heard the Qur'an recited from the mouth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were the people who had the Qur'an preserved in their hearts. They were the people who recited the Qur'an in the morning, in the night, who taught people the Qur'an. If they could forget the Qur'an, then what about us? What about us? So if we have forgotten something of the Qur'an, 
isn't it necessary that we reconnect with the book of Allah? That we remind ourselves of the beautiful gems, of the beautiful guidance that Allah has given in this Qur'an? Isn't it necessary that we revisit this beautiful gift that Allah has given? We reconnect with the book of Allah? Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even he used to review the Qur'an in this month. In Bukhari we learn that Jibreel would come to visit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam every night in the month of Ramadan. And remember, Jibreel would not come when he wanted or when the Prophet ﷺ wanted. When would Jibreel visit the Prophet ﷺ? When? When Allah ordered him. So if Jibreel is coming to the Prophet ﷺ every single night, and making the Prophet ﷺ review the Qur'an, this is being done at whose orders? At whose instructions? At the instruction of Rabbul Alameen. If the Messenger ﷺ needed to review the Qur'an every night, then what about us? Then what about us? We also need to reconnect with the Qur'an. Now the question is, how do we reconnect with the Book of Allah in this month? Through different ways. First of all, let's do what the Prophet ﷺ did. And what did he do? Tilawa, Recitation. Because the month of Ramadan is a month of Qur'an. And in this month, the one action that should be most visible after fasting should be, should be which? Ibadah? Ibadah with the Qur'an. This should be the most visible, the most prominent, the most evident ibadah in the month of Ramadan after fasting. And what is that? With the Qur'an. And this is why we see that the Salaf, what would they do? Imam Malik, he would say that this is the month of Qur'an and therefore, لا كلام فيه إلا مع القرآن There is no talking, no chatting, no conversation in this month except with the Qur'an. It's as if he is telling people, I love you, however, I need to talk to the Qur'an more than I talk to you in this month. Do we spend our time talking? Lots, isn't it? We talk to our friends, we talk to our families, we talk you know, through our mouths, on the phone, or with people who are sitting in front of us, and sometimes through text messages, right? Status updates and so on and so forth. We're always conversing, conversing. Imam Malik said, this month is for talking with the Qur'an. Just as we spend hours talking to people, now... Hours should be spent talking to the Qur'an. Now the question is, how do you talk to the Qur'an? How do you talk to the Qur'an? By reading it and listening to it. Because you see, this is how you carry a conversation. You speak, and then you listen. We talk, and then we listen. So likewise, in this month, inshaAllah, we have to spend some time, however much time we can, in recitation of the Qur'an, and also in listening to the Qur'an. So for example, in Salatul Taraweeh, many of us inshallah will get a chance to listen to the Qur'an. But should that be it? No. More than that. Recitation of the Qur'an in the day also. In the day also. Or if we're not able to go for Salatul Taraweeh ourselves, then reciting Qur'an ourselves. Listening and reciting. Because when a person recites the Qur'an, then what happens? He is rewarded for every single letter. Every single letter. What's the reward? Ten good deeds. Ten good deeds for every letter. Now imagine if you do that while you're fasting. Isn't the reward going to be more? It is. Because now it's added up with another act of worship. So there is more reward for reciting the Qur'an in the month of Ramadan while a person is fasting. And when a person is fasting, then remember, when he reads the Qur'an, then the Qur'an will intercede for him on the Day of Judgment. In a hadith we learn that the Prophet ﷺ said, on the Day of Resurrection, the Qur'an will appear in the form of a lean, weak human being. Another hadith tells us a pale human being. And it will say to 
the person who used to recite the Qur'an, do you recognize me? Has it ever happened with you? Somebody just comes in front of you and says, do you recognize me? Has it ever happened? And you're trying to remember, and you cannot remember, but you don't want to offend the other person also. Right? So anyway, the Qur'an will say, do you recognize me? The person will say, I do not recognize you. The Qur'an will say, I am your companion, the Qur'an, who kept you thirsty in the scorching heat. Qur'an that kept you thirsty in the heat, meaning it was hot, you were fasting, you were thirsty, but you kept reciting me, you were thirsty because of me. Because think about it, if we keep quiet, all right, our mouth is, is shut, and we are lying down, are we going to feel thirsty? No, not really. And even if we do feel thirsty, it's easier to control it. Why? Because we're lying down and very soon we're going to doze off. And we can sleep for two, three hours and the fast is over. Right? But when a person chooses to recite the Qur'an, then what is he doing? He's keeping himself thirsty. In the heat. He cannot even have a sip of water, but he's thirsty. The Qur'an will say, I kept you thirsty in the heat of the day. And I kept you awake at night. The night was short. You could have slept, but you chose to recite the Qur'an in salah. I kept you awake. Those few hours you had, you sacrificed them for the book of Allah. The Qur'an will say to the person, that every trader, meaning every person who does business, he does so with the intention of gaining profit. So today is the day when you will get your reward. When you will redeem your points. right? When you will get your rewards. And what is the reward? Because the Qur'an will then intercede for the person. So we learn in the hadith that the person will be given kingship in his right hand. He will be like a king in Jannah. So much of freedom, authority, lavish, everything, comfort. He will be granted kingdom in his right hand. Eternity in his left hand. Eternity in his left hand. So he will be in Jannah forever. He will be made to wear the crown of respect and dignity. His parents will be made to wear silky robes, silky dresses. Beautiful, elegant dresses that will be more precious than the world and whatever is in it. And the parents will ask, why have we been given this? Why are we being treated in this way? And they will be told, because you taught your child the Qur'an. You taught your child the Qur'an and your child read the Qur'an even when he was fasting. So he was thirsty but he kept reading it. So imagine, recitation of Qur'an while fasting is not just something that will bring benefit to the reciter, but it will also be a source of honor for his or her parents. Honor for them on the Day of Judgment. Now what happens is that in the month of Ramadan, sometimes we hesitate to recite the Qur'an. Why? Because they're people. In the masjid for example, we have about 15 minutes before salah, we want to recite the Qur'an, but there are so many people, and we feel shy of reciting the Qur'an in front of them. Or at home, our families are there. We feel shy. The Prophet ﷺ said, that the one who recites the Qur'an in a loud voice, loud voice, loud, not in the sense that the person is screaming, No, loud in the sense that others can hear him. Then he is like one who gives sadaqah openly. Why is it like sadaqah? Because when you recite the Qur'an to someone, someone gets to listen, they're also getting a chance to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Isn't it? Because they're getting to listen to the Qur'an. They're getting to reflect on the Qur'an. So it's as if you're giving sadaqah. But how sadaqah openly? Why? Because you're reciting Qur'an openly. And the one who recites the Qur'an quietly is like the one who gives sadaqah secretly. Both are good. Both are good. It's a win-win situation. So if we get a chance to recite the Qur'an when others can hear us, good alhamdulillah. But obviously the intention must be correct. And if we get a chance to recite the Qur'an in our privacy, when nobody can hear, even that is good. It's a win-win situation. The recitation of the Qur'an. What is this? It's a very, very noble deed. 
Once a man came to Abu Sa'id al-Khudri and he said, advise me. Has it ever happened? That you ask somebody, can you please advise me? The month of Ramadan is coming. I'm really nervous about it. Can you please advise me? Right? I'm going to go into the school. Can you please advise me? I'm going to get married. Can you advise me? Huh? So this person is asking Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, advise me. Some advice that will benefit me for life. For life. What should I do? What should I hold on to? Abu Sa'id al-Khudri said that you have asked me what I asked the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Meaning I asked him the same question. So I will tell you what the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa told me. And what was that? أُوصِيكَ بِتَقْوَ اللَّهِ I advise you to have fear of Allah. فَإِنَّهُ رَأْسُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ For it is the head of everything. Meaning the main portion. It is the leader. It is the, the crux of everything. And you must strive in the way of Allah. Because that is the monasticism of Islam. And you must engage in the remembrance of Allah. وَعَلَيْكَ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَتِلَاوَةِ الْقُرْآنِ You must adhere to the remembrance of Allah and the recitation of the Qur'an. Why? فَإِنَّهُ رَوْحُكَ فِي السَّمَاءِ وَذِكْرُكَ فِي الْأَرْضِ For it is a means of your life in the sky and your mention on earth. Life in the sky. Meaning if you really want to be well known, alive, you know like a living personality. You're like a living personality, a person who's alive. What happens? You get their updates all the time. They're now in this country, they're in that country, they're doing this, they're doing that, right? You, you get their live updates, right? So a living person. So when a person recites the Qur'an, he becomes famous where? Famous where? Amongst the angels. So the angels talk about him. Oh, this person, today he completed the recitation of Surah Al-Anfal. Yeah, today he completed the recitation of the entire Qur'an. The angels talk about the person who recites the Qur'an and remembers Allah. He becomes famous where? In the skies. We all have this desire, right? That people should remember us. They should talk about us. They should take interest in us. They should pay attention to us. The Prophet ﷺ guided us that we should seek this kind of praise. Praise from who? The angels. Right? And obviously, what does that mean? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also be happy with His servant. So, فَإِنَّهُ رَوْحُكَ فِي السَّمَاءِ وَذِكْرُكَ فِي الْأَرْضِ And your fame also in the earth. So it's amazing that when a person is reciting the Qur'an here in this world, where is he being mentioned? In the sky. فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرْكُمْ Remember me, remember Allah, and Allah will remember you. And also remember that the recitation of the Qur'an is better than anything in this world. One day the Prophet ﷺ saw the Sahaba, they were sitting in the masjid, talking amongst themselves. And the Prophet ﷺ said to them, he asked them, that who amongst you would like to go to such and such marketplace and bring from there two camels of the best breed, healthy camels, for free. For free. So who amongst you would like to go to an auto mall every day and bring two cars for free. Good cars. Not old, you know, used. No. New, good cars. Who would like that? Two for free every day. Maybe you're not interested in cars. Let me put it in your context. What is it? People's jewelry store? Burks and all that, right? Uh, Tiffany. Tiffany and Co. Okay. Who would like to go to Tiffany every morning and come back with two pieces of jewelry? Original, real, real diamonds. Who would like that? White gold, platinum. Who would like that? I mean, there's no question about this. Everybody would like it. It's so obvious that you don't even feel the need to raise your hand here. Right? It's so obvious. The Sahaba said, everyone would like that. The Prophet ﷺ said, if one of you were to go to the masjid and recite or learn or teach, Two ayat of the Qur'an, that is better for you than those camels. If you go to the masjid one morning, and you end up reciting or listening to 
or learning or teaching just two ayat that is better than a trip to Tiffany and coming back with free jewelry it's better than that and it's up to us whether we want to limit ourselves to two or more two or more it's up to us it's a treasure because what happens to the cars of this world what happens to the jewelry of this world does it not become old does it not lose its shine Hmm? What happens to it? Does it not lose its value? I mean a car, the moment it drives out of a dealership, that's it. What happens to its value? A huge percentage of it is just lost. It's gone. It's gone. But gaining the ilm of the Qur'an, spending time with the book of Allah, this is something that is a source of endless, continuous reward for a person. So what better time to learn the book of Allah, to recite the book of Allah, to reflect on the book of Allah, to teach the book of Allah, than this one. Even if it's just two ayat a day. Just two ayat. And we learn that a person who recites the Qur'an, then he will be protected in the grave also. In a hadith we learn that a man is placed in his grave. And now put yourself in that position. A person is placed in his grave. Who's with him? Who's with her? Nobody. There's no phone, no human being, no access to anybody. Alone. And when he is approached from the side of his head. Why? Because of the sins that he has committed. Approached by what? By punishment. Because if you think about it, are we not sinful? Do we not commit sins? With our head also? I mean, think about the times when we have you know, shaken our head in pride. You know, jerked our head or something in pride. Isn't that a sin of the head? What's in the head? Our mind, our brain, our thoughts. So think about the number of times that we have entertained negative thoughts about Allah's servants. These are all sins, right? And they're endless. So when the punishment will approach him from the side of his head, the recitation of the Qur'an will repel the punishment. It will come between the person and the punishment. That no, you can't reach him through me. The Qur'an will come in between and say, no, you cannot reach this person. It will shield him from punishment. And this is a hadith in At-Tabarani. When the punishment will approach him from his side, from his side, to the right or the left side, then charity will repel the punishment. How much sadaqah did a person give? When the punishment will approach him from the side of his feet, then his walking to the masjid is going to repel it. So this month, as we walk to the masjid, as we engage in sadaqah, as we also recite the Qur'an, do it with ihtisab. What is ihtisab? Expecting reward from Allah, hoping reward from Allah, keeping a goal in mind, Don't just do it because you have to do it and everybody is doing it. And this is just something that we do. Do it with this in mind. Ya Allah, I'm walking to the masjid at 11 p.m. My kitchen sink is full with dirty dishes. My laundry is just piling up. My body is exhausted. But I'm walking to the masjid because I want to spend the night praying to you. You save me at a time when I'm alone in my grave. Giving sadaqah. Reciting the Qur'an. Keep this intention in mind. Then we see that the recitation of the Qur'an, not just during the day, but especially in Qiyamul Layl. In Qiyamul Layl. If a person gets to go for Taraweeh, excellent. But if we're not able to go for whatever reason, you have work, or you have a family, young children, whom you have to look after, because of whom you cannot go to the masjid, that doesn't mean we deprive ourselves of this treasure, of this great opportunity. Listen to this hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said, الصيام والقرآن يشفعان للعبد يوم القيامة Fasting and the Qur'an will both intercede for the servant on the day of judgment. يقول الصيام Fasting will say, أي ربي O Lord, منعته الطعام والشهوات بالنهار أي ربي Fasting will say, أي ربي, O Lord, I prevented this person from food and from fulfilling his desires during the day. فَشَفِّعْنِي فِيهِ 
allow me to intercede for him allow me to intercede for him wa yaqulu al quran and the quran will say manatuhu an nawm bil layl o allah i prevented him from sleep in the night he couldn't sleep because of me he couldn't sleep in those few hours even because of me so allow me to intercede for him the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said fa yushaffa'an then both will be given permission to intercede for the person and imagine when fasting and quran are fighting for a person arguing for a person then no this person should not be punished no this person should go to jannah yes this person should be given a higher rank in jannah then is that person going to suffer on that day but we have to give a little here so we can get a lot there we have to give up some of our sleep some of our comfort spend some of our night in the recitation of the quran so that we can be successful on that day the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said man qama ramadana imanan wa ihtisaban ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min zambi the person who establishes prayer during the nights of ramadan this is not the five daily prayers This is establishing the prayer when in the night of Ramadan. What does it mean? Every night a person spent some time in Qiyamul Layl. And what is he doing in Qiyamul Layl? Reciting the Quran. But he does it with iman, with sincere faith and hoping to attain Allah's rewards. Then all all of his past sins shall be forgiven. All of his past sins shall be forgiven, wiped off. Because of what? his praying in the nights of ramadan qiyamul layl is the best prayer after the fard prayers the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that afdalu salati ba'da al faridati salatul layl the best prayer after the prescribed prayer is the night prayer it is the night prayer jibril once came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and said ya muhammad ish ma shi'ta fa innaka mayyit Live as long as you want eventually you are going to die wa ahbib man ahbabta fa innaka mufariquhu love whoever you wish ultimately you shall leave it wa'mal ma shi'ta fa innaka majziyun bi do what you wish you will be recompensed for it وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ شَرَفَ الْمُؤْمِنْ قِيَامُهُ بِاللَّيْلِ Know that the honor, the nobility of a believer is in his prayer in the night. The more a person prays in the night, the higher, the greater his rank is in the sight of Allah. وَعِزُّهُ إِسْتِغْنَاؤُهُ عَنِ النَّاسِ And his honor is in being free of need of people. meaning not wanting what people have this is what will bring honor to a human being jibril advised the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that what is the honor of a believer it is his standing in prayer in the night because this is something that will cause people to enter jannah with security the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that pray in the night while the people are asleep and you shall enter jannah in safety tadkhulu al-jannah bi salam there are special homes in jannah unique homes whose outside can be seen from the inside and the inside can be seen from outside and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he described these beautiful houses in jannah a man said liman hiya ya rasulullah who get those houses ya rasulullah and he said liman tab al kalam for the one who says good speech who speaks well wa at'ama at'am and he gives food to others he feeds others wa bata qa'iman wa an-nas niyam and he spends the night standing while the people are asleep this is the person who will achieve high levels in jannah now the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam what kind of qiyamul layl would he perform in the month of ramadan or even in general In a hadith we learn Hudayfa radhiyallahu anhu he said that I came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in one of the nights of Ramadan and stood with him to pray so he found the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam praying so he just joined him He said when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the takbir he said Allahu akbar 
ذو الملكوت والجبروت والكبرياء والعظمة so he glorified he praised Allah then the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam after surah al-fatiha he recited al-baqara surah al-baqara the entire surah al-baqara then he recited surah an-nisa the entire surah an-nisa then he recited surah ali imran the entire surah ali imran hudayfa said the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would not pass by any verse of warning except that he paused there he took his time He then went into rukur and he did tasbihat and then again he went into sujood and then when he got up again he recited more Quran and then he said the salam now what do we see the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam his qiyamul lail was not for the purpose of just completing 8 rak'at it was not just for the purpose of completing 20 rak'at It was not just for the sake of doing Qiyamul Layl. It was for the purpose of reciting Qur'an in Qiyamul Layl. That is what he did. And that is what we should also aspire to do. In fact, when a person recites just 10 ayat in Qiyamul Layl, he gets the reward of Qintar, a heap of reward. When a person recites a hundred ayat in Qiyamul Layl, then the reward for the entire night of worship is written for him. And when a person recites a thousand verses, then he is of the muqantireen, those who are given more and more of reward, heaps and heaps of reward, meaning uncountable. So this is the time when we recite the Qur'an in the day, as well as in the night. And when we recite just like the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did we also reflect upon the quran because allah says kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarakun liyadabbaru ayati this kitab we have revealed why so that people reflect on its verses it's not just for recitation it's also for reflection many of us we think that when it comes to the quran my goal is to complete the study of the quran My goal is to complete the recitation of the Quran or my goal is to complete the memorization of the Quran these are not goals these are not goals these are all means means to what reflection on the Quran tadabbur on the Quran because when a person studies the Quran he's able to reflect on the Quran now once the study is done an endless journey of tadabbur should begin you understand likewise when a person memorizes the quran he's able to recite it he can recite it fluently now it doesn't mean that he can put the quran away no it means now the endless journey the lifelong journey of reflection on the quran should begin because when we reflect on the quran we think about ourselves we see our mistakes we do something to fix our selves we improve our condition our state we do amal on the quran and that is what the quran was revealed for our guidance and this is why inshallah just before this month of ramadan starting tomorrow inshallah we will begin the review of the meaning of the quran inshallah one juz a day inshallah every single day starting tomorrow and the goal is to review the meaning of the quran why so that we can reflect on it so that when we will be reciting the quran in this month and we will be listening to it we know what we're saying so that we can be of those who allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes as al muttaqin because this quran is is what hudan lil muttaqin may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to spend this month with his book in his worship and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to make this month a successful month so that he is happy with us and we are happy with him may our deeds be amalan mutaqabbalan inshallah tomorrow when we begin our program of fahm al quran we will be using the translation of sahih international all right and if you have that mushaf with you i would recommend that you bring that with you because i will be reading that translation and you want to be able to follow along easily right so inshallah if you have it bring it if you'd like to just use it off of the internet there are many sites that have that translation for free so inshallah you can also bring that and with that inshallah we conclude our program subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi 
وبركاته